أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين الحمد لله مالك الملك مجري الفلك مسخر الرياح فالق الإصباح ديان الدين رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلقه وخاتم أنبيائه ورسله سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد الله أسوأ وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين يقولون ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين واجعلنا للمتقين إماما آمنا بالله Sadaqallahu al-Ali al-Azim for the purification of the souls and the enlightenment of the hearts and for the hastening of the reappearance of Baqiyatullah al-A'zam, Ruhi wa Arwahu al-Alameen lahu al-Fida Enlighten your souls and the atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh He was the ruler or the king of his time marching in the streets of Baghdad, noticing a group of individuals, young men, young children playing on the streets. As soon as he reaches where they were, they disperse except one of them. He stands unfazed, without any consideration for his entourage. He looks at this young man and asks him, why have you not moved? Why have you not followed the other children? The response from the young man is that there is no reason for me to be fearful. Neither have I sinned or performed anything against you, nor have I obstructed you in such any manner at all. At that moment, the ruler known as al Ma'mun al-Abbasi was impressed by the answer, carries on with his journey and movement, finds a falcon who presents him and brings back a small fish in his peaks. And he places it in his hands, walks back to that young man and asks him, what is inside the palms of my hands? That young man asks and answers actually by saying that God the Almighty has created falcons who go to the sea and they collect and they pick small fish and they bring it to the rulers of that time so that they can examine members of the holy household. Ma'moon, of course, was very much impressed with the answer of the young man. He asks him, who are you? He says, Ana Muhammad ibn Ali. He recognizes that the young man was none other than the holy tenth, ninth Imam, Imam Muhammad ibn Ali in al-Jawad al-Taqi, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, who indeed inspired many because of the issues surrounding his life. When you examine the biography of the Holy Ninth Imam, a number of controversies arise. Perhaps these are often discussed when looking at the auspicious occasion of his wiladat or the sad martyrdom of Imam al-Jawad, salamullahi alayhi. Issues such as, for instance, how he assumed the position of Imam at the age of seven. Because we are told he was born in the year 195 after Hijra, on the, according to some traditions, the 10th of the month of Rajab al Murajab. And he was martyred on towards the end of the month of Dhul Qa'da in the year 220 after Hijra, therefore making his illustrious life 25 years in terms of his lifespan. And of course, when it comes to comparison with the other imam, this was the shortest. Yet the argument, of course, is normally presented and is discussed extensively. And I don't wish to go through this examination or discussion surrounding how a seven-year-old can assume imam in such a tender age. Imam salam himself very briefly answers by saying that if you examine the Quran, Allah wa ta'ala mentions the story of Isa. And Isa alayhi salam, of course, when he speaks on the cradle, what does he say? He says, Inni Abdullah atani al kitab wa ja'alani nabiyya. And he has made me a prophet. In other words, he uses the present tense 
which means that Isa alayhi salam was a prophet from birth, highlighting that when it comes to the position of the vicegerency and the representation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of guidance and leadership on this earth, this has nothing to do with an age of a human being. It is to do, in fact, with their wisdom, with their intellect, with their depth and the extent of their knowledge. Imam salam also cites examples from the Quran. But of course, the demonstration of the superiority of Imam al-Jawad over every other human being alive at that time was made through his knowledge, the extensive knowledge that was presented to people in many cases. When Al-Ma'mun decided to marry his daughter Umm Al-Fadl to Imam Al-Jawad, this indeed became something which wasn't acceptable by the Abbasids. They saw that Al-Ma'mun wanted to get close to Imam Al-Rida, and this was the mission of the Abbasids, by the way. How did the Abbasids assume the Khilafah from the Umayyads? They gathered around and they lifted the flag or the claim and nusra to Li Ali Muhammad that we will give victory to the family of the Holy Prophet. Of course, it was full of deception. Ma'moon, in his attempts to get closer to the Ahl al-Bayt, and specifically closer to Imam al-Rida, wanted to get the Shia, or the followers of the Imam alayhum salam, with him, as far as acceptance of his Khilafah. You'll find that when he decided to marry his daughter to Imam al-Jawad, and some people ask the question, how is this possible? How does Imam, or how did the Imam marry? And this is another controversial element if people haven't understood the illustrious life of the holy ninth Imam. Imam alayhi salam was forced to marry Umm al-Fadl. There is no doubt about it in history. At the same time, we find that she was a wretched individual who used to beat the maids, and Imam alayhi salam several times admonished her. Later on, she was responsible primarily after being given the poison by Al-Mu'tasim, the brother of Al-Ma'moon, which he administered to Imam Al-Jawad, causing his martyrdom. Yet what we find is that Umm Al-Fadl and her marriage to Imam Al-Jawad brought discomfort to the Bani Al-Abbas. They said to Al-Ma'moon, how could you make an individual, a young man who has reached the age of 10 or 11 thereabouts, marry your daughter? In other words, how would you accept this? Al-Ma'moon would say that he is from the Ahl al-Bayt. Innahu min Ahlu Baytin Zuqqul Alma Zaqqa. He is from a family, from the progeny of the Prophet, in which knowledge has immersed within them. In other words, they are deeply rooted in understanding of the faith. You all have heard and come across the famous debate that took place between the Imam alayhi salam and the jurist at that time, the Qadi. Yahya ibn Aktham, who the traditions tell us in many books of hadith and literature, they tell us, of course, that the challenge was made and several hundred scholars were present in the presence of Al Ma'moon and the Imam. Salam. And the idea was to present the knowledge of the Imam to those who were doubting. Yahya came forward and he wanted to ask the Imam a simple question Tell me of an individual who hunts whilst they're in the state of ihram. Imam Ali salam of course responds back by saying, was it during the day or the night? Was it Umrah or Hajj? Did he know or did he not know? Was it the first time or has he done it before? He asks a number of important pertinent questions to ascertain the Islamic jurisprudential answer, which completely amazed and perplexed Yahya, who was not able to answer the jurist at that time, considered one of the most knowledgeable individuals. At that moment, Imam salam was asked by Ma'moon to ask Yahya some questions. And Imam asked him, tell me about the individual who looked at the person, who looked at a lady, and she's haram for him. At noon, in the afternoon, she became halal for him. In the evening, she became haram for him. In the morning, she became haram for him. At lunchtime, she became halal for him. And in the afternoon, she became haram for him. And in the evening, she became halal for him. Yahya said, I have no idea. This all halal and haram has made me go dizzy. I have no idea. Imam alayhi salam was told by Ma'moon, clarify this matter. Imam says that if a man looks at a lady who is a slave girl, indeed this look is haram. 
Yet later on in the afternoon he purchases her, she, becomes, she becomes halal. In the evening he frees her, she becomes haram. Later on in the morning, what does he do? He marries her, she becomes halal. In the lunchtime at noon, he performs or practices dhihar. He says to her, you are to me like my mother. She becomes haram. In the afternoon, what does he do? He pays the compensation and he becomes halal to her. Later on in the evening, what does he do? He, of course, says what to her? He says to her, you are divorced once. And in the morning, he takes her back. He practices this revoking of the divorce. Imam Salam highlighted his knowledge there. In another interesting tradition that perhaps many of the mu'mineen have not come across, which I found today in the book Al-Ihtijaj. In this book by Shaykh Al-Tabrasi, Imam Salam engages in a debate, in another debate with Yahya ibn Aktham. And the Imam Salam says to, or Yahya ibn Aktham says to the Imam, he says to him, tell me, that what have you come across the tradition when it comes to the position of the first and the second Khalifa, which says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibra'il to whom? To the Holy Prophet and says, As-salamu yuqri'uka as salam that Allah sends his peace and blessings be upon you and asks you to go and ask the first Khalifa, Abu Bakr, are you pleased with me or not? What do you think about that? Imam alayhi salam responds back by saying, you see, this is the methodology and this is the way of dialogue that the imma alayhi salam would engage with people from other schools of thought. That when the imma alayhi salam are presented by an individual, for instance, Abdullah ibn Umair, who comes and asks Imam al-Baqir, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. A narration that we referred to last week in Salah, where he says to Imam, he says to him, that it has come to my attention that you have made mut'a, the, in, the temporary marriage, permissible. Is this true? There is a rumor out there. Is this true? Imam alayhi salam says, indeed it's in the book of Allah, in the Holy Quran, chapter 4, Surah An-Nisa, ayah 24. وَلَقَدْ سَنَّهَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ بِهَا أَصْحَابُهُ That Rasulullah practiced it. And his companions also followed suit. At that moment, the man said to the Imam, to the grandson of Rasulullah, he said, وَلَقَدْ نَهَا عَنْهَا عُمَر That the second Khalifa, Umar ibn al-Khattab, indeed had forbade it. Imam responds back by saying what? Notice the difference between the methodology of the Imam and the mentality of some people today when they engage in dialogue, where they use hatred and animosity in their presentations. Imam alayhi salam said, then leave yourself. You follow the path of your friend and I follow the message, message and the pathway of my prophet. Simple. It does not need any more talk, any more consideration. Imam says to this individual, he doesn't say to him, you're talking nonsense. Of course, he begins the discussion by saying to him, he says to him, be aware that in Hajjatul Wada' the holy prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny, indeed made sure that people understood that after him there will come individuals who will fabricate hadith that will place hadith which has no basis remember that rasulullah has said whomsoever does so let them anticipate their position in jahannam let them understand that their position in Jahannam is reserved for them. There is a special seat in, in Jahannam for them. Those individuals who have taken part in wad of hadith. What do you find the Imam says to him? Imam says to him, have you not read the Quran? That Allah is closer to the human being than the jugular vein. And doesn't the Quran say, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَحُولُ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَقَلْبِهِ That Allah lies between the human being and his own heart. How is it possible that Allah seeks and goes to the Prophet to go and ask the first Khalifa about how he feels about the Almighty? Whereas the Almighty knows before him. The individual then asks him, he says to him, how about the tradition that says, Mathalu, the first Khalifa and the second Khalifa, fil ard, ka Jibra'il wa Mika'il fil sama'. 
That the example of the first two is what? Two uh, similitude to Mikael and Jibrail in the heavens. Imam alayhi salam says, Mikael and Jibrail are angels of Allah that did never perform any form of shirk, nor did they commit any disobedience. You cannot compare individuals who bow down to idols to angels of God who are pure. Amazing. This is the rationality and the methodology of the Imam The man then says to him, but tell me one thing. We have a hadith which says that Abu Bakr, Sayyid Kuhuli Ahl al Jannah, that the first Khalifa is the master of those who are elderly in paradise. You see, the problem we have, of course, at the time of Muawiyah, he used to pay thousands to people like Samar ibn Jundab and others to fabricate hadith when they came across the tradition that states, Ana Madinatul Ilm wa Aliyun Babuha, I am the city of knowledge and Ali since gate. They came forward with what? And so on. And this individual is its window. That person is the back door and so on. Here they have the similar example. Imam Ali Salam says, Bal wadaaha Banu Umayyah. This is a hadith that is fabricated by Banu Umayyah. Why? Imam himself says. He says, Lianna al Hadith, who are what? The hadith is Al Hassan wal Hussein, Sayyida Shababi Ahl al Jannah. That Al Hassan and Hussein are the masters of the use of paradise. This is a hadith that is fabricated. Then the Imam does not leave it there. And he says, Fa'lam, know that every human being who enters Jannah shall enter as a youth. There will be no elderly on the day of judgment in Jannah. Which means this hadith has no basis. You'll find, therefore, the Imam alayhi salam countered such ideas and, and indeed became known for the dissemination of the knowledge from its correct and rightful source. The examination of the life of Imam alayhi salam has a number of stages. And of course, many different angles can be looked at and dissected. Yet in the next few minutes, I wish to utilize the auspicious anniversary of the wilada of Imam al-Jawad al-Taqi salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi in order to discuss a matter which is prevalent and often discussed when it comes to or analyzed and examined when looking at the life of the Imam alayhi salam. And that is the importance and the crucial element of child upbringing and the tarbiyah and the correct nurturing of our children in the path of the religion of Islam and the school of Ahl al-Bayt. Why is this so important, especially in this day and age? Because we have a growing trend of parents, perhaps some of the parents here may share this opinion. I myself have been fortunate enough to discuss and to indeed be approached by some parents, both fathers and mothers who have come across, have come forward and said that when it comes to their offsprings, when it comes to their uh, children, especially the youth, when they're 15, 16, they no longer s hear them or become obedient to them. And at the same time, they have somewhat left the path and are not doing what their parents would like them to do. And at the same time, you'll find an ideology that exists out there that is growing in popularity due to the influence of the Western culture and practices. And that is that the role of parents is primarily focused upon physical nurturing and development in terms of the presentation towards the children or whatever they require when it comes to food, clothing, schools. Yet when it comes to spiritual upliftment and development, a lot of parents or sometimes certain individuals come forward and argue in such a manner. What do they say? They say we have examples in history whereby parents have been righteous and the children have emerged not with the qualities that they desire. In other words, not with virtuous characteristics and vice versa. So they cite examples. For instance, they say Prophet Nuh, look at his son. His son became disobedient. His son would say to his father that I will stand on the top point of the mountain that will protect me from the eventual rise of the flood. And of course, Nuh would say to him, Ya Bunayyar, kab ma'ana wa la takun ma'al kafirin. Do not be of those individuals who associate themselves with the disbelievers. 
Yet others also cite examples of individuals, young men and women, who have been nurtured in atmospheres or households which are far from religion. Some of you have come across the story of a man by the name of Al-Qasim Al-Mu'taman. Who is Al-Qasim Al-Mu'taman? Al-Qasim Al-Mu'taman was the son of Harun Al-Abbasi. I have a severe problem with individuals with my respect to them who say Harun Al-Rashid. Al-Rashid was given to him as a title by his followers because it gives the idea that Rashid is an upright individual. Harun al-Abbasi was far from this, an individual who would address the clouds and say, oh clouds, you can rain wherever you wish because your rain will fall onto ground that belongs to me. This was his arrogance and this was his extent of his tyranny, of course, is very much recorded in history. Yet he had a son by the name of Qasim. One day, they, people around Ma'moon came, uh, Harun and said, came and said to him, Ya, so-called the commander of the faithful, they said to him, your son is disobedient. He does not do what we wish him to do. He does not perform the commands of the administration of the government. He called his son. He said, what's wrong with you? He said, I'm not interested. He said, tomorrow morning, I will send you to Egypt and you will become the governor of Egypt, whether you like it or not. Now, here was a difficult decision for Qasim, who was upright, righteous, a follower of the Ahl al-Bayt, an individual who had to make this tough decision and how many of us normally do. He woke up in the morning and what did he decide to do? He decided to run away. He ran away to Basra. He came, he reached Basra. He stood in a line with a group of workers waiting to work in construction, in building, whatever. So there would be a place where people would find workers. There was a man by the name of Abdullah al-Basri. He came, he saw this individual. He said, I want you to work for me. Start work. He paid him one dirham a day. The son of the Khalifa at that time, yet he was not faced. He worked and worked for a while. Yet Abdullah saw in this man true righteousness and virtue. Characteristics which were upright. He started to like him because his akhlaq were exemplary. At that moment, one day, he asked for him. He wasn't there. He said, where is he? They said, he's fallen ill. He went to see him. He sat next to him. He sat next to the son of Harun. He said to him, you haven't come to work today. He said, I'm sorry that I'm ill today. And I've been told by the physician that this is an illness that will result in my death. And I know that I will die soon. Therefore, because I have worked for you and I trust you, I will give you a secret. That is that I am the son of Harun. This individual was... Shaken when he heard this. They said, you are the son of the Khalifa and I've been treating you in this way. He said, don't worry. Yet, I want you to do the following. I have this ring. He took it out from his pocket and said, please pass this ring back towards my father because this ring does not belong to me. It was taken and it was given to me and it was taken forcefully from Baytul Mal. And I do not wish to die having the burden and the responsibility of this ring. At that moment, the tradition tells us he looked to this side and he said, Assalamu alayka ya Amir al Mu'mineen, and he passed away. He died. He left this world. They cite this example. They say an individual who sacrificed and despite having wretched parents would come out as an example towards others to follow. Yet the reality, of course, is that Allah wa ta'ala has made you and I and this existence go through asbab, go through means. And yet there are examples out there that come out which are not, which do not fall into the common trend and the understanding of people. Yet the realization is that when it comes to the importance of the nurturing and the development of the children, especially in such communities and societies we find the Quran places such a great emphasis that Prophet Ibrahim when it comes to being given the position of Imam what does he say when Allah wa says Ibrahim Allah says to Ibrahim now you are given the position of Imam after being a friend of Allah after being the Prophet of Allah and the Messenger of Allah, the final position that he assumes is the leadership of mankind. What does Ibrahim say? Thank you very much. He doesn't. What does Ibrahim say? Ibrahim says, oh Allah, I will fulfill it and complete it in the best way. He doesn't. 
The first thing that Ibrahim alayhi salam says, Qala wa min Oh Allah, I want it for my children as well. Why? The traditions tell us that Ibrahim learnt and saw what happened to Nuh. And of course, what happened to his son and his disobedience. And therefore wanted his progeny to be upright and to be individuals who carry the message of monotheism and disseminate the teachings of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, the Quran places emphasis upon the role of parents. In fact, Islam emphasizes the respect to parents primarily Due to the responsibility that falls on the sh shoulders of parents. Today what we have parents is saying madrasa. They're saying lectures. They're saying Islamic center. Or mosque. Or Imam Barga will fulfill. As far as I'm concerned, I will work. My wife will work. And the development will come from these sources. And this is of course something that we have to face. We have to realize that today our youngsters are facing challenges that are unique, that have not been faced perhaps by the others, the elders back in different societies. Let me give you one statistic that I brought with me, and that is that when it comes to a study recently taken and published by the University of Bristol when it comes to the sexualization of children, they said that one in three teenage girls have suffered in the United Kingdom some form of sexual abuse when it comes to relationships with boyfriends. One in three. Can you imagine? Likewise, they've said one in six have felt the pressure to have an intimate relationship with the opposite gender. 90%, mark these statistics, 90% of 13 to 17 year olds from both sexes have been in an intimate relationship. 90% of 13 to 17 year olds. These are quite strong and prevalent and damning statistics that should really awaken us and give us this encouragement if, this, if that doesn't exist about our responsibility and what is it that we should be doing. Of course, the subject is extensive and we could look at it from many different angles. But I will summarize, seeking inspiration from the life of Imam al-Jawad, peace and blessings be upon him, by looking at a number of factors that we need to keep in mind, especially in this day and age. Number one, in every endeavor, mu'mineen, brothers and sisters, in every project or initiative that you and I seek to become successful at, we plan. We have a strategy. Ask many of the parents today. Ask those who have children and those who do not have children, what is your strategy when it comes to child development and upbringing? The correct Islamic tarbiyah. How will you ensure that your children are brought up in the right, in the correct manner and are nurtured under the teachings of the Qur'an and the Ahl al-Bayt You will perhaps get some blank faces. There will be stares. They'll say, well, you know what, I'll do this and I'll do that. There needs to be a strategy. There needs to be a plan agreed by both the father and the mother, by both the husband and the wife. And this is also a message for those who are not married yet. Because this subject is not, it does not only, of course, appeal to those who have children or those planning to have children, but those wanting to establish this blessed family unit, which is under great danger in this particular society in the West. Because today the definition of a family unit is changing. No longer will a husband and a wife come together and this will be called a family. Today, two of the same genders come together and they are recognized as a family. And a marriage can take place with this so-called legalized. So the idea that there therefore is that there has to be a long-term vision. There was a, a lady who is the mother of Ayatollah Ja'far al-Shushtari. Great scholar of ours. She was asked, why, what did you do so that your child becomes a mujtahid, such a learned individual? She responds by saying that my plan with my husband was that my son becomes like Ja'far al-Sadiq. When, when, when this was our plan, he became Ja'far al-Shushtari. Of course, if you have high goals, you will be able to achieve some success. You need to aim high in all capacities and in all facets. Number one. Number two, the Holy Prophet of Islam, Rasul al-A'zam Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. 
mentions the importance of recognizing that the upbringing of children starts and begins from birth. Contrary to common belief that perhaps it's something that is left later on when they develop, when they begin to understand, when they have a meaningful conversation. The Holy Prophet is narrated to have said that the rights of your children above you or over you are three. Number one, you give them a good name. You name them something or give them a name that they become proud of. Not something that causes discomfort to them or is a reason for others to ridicule. We have in history, for instance, uh, a lady by the name of Asiya. Asiya, the one who disobeys. Asiya, the daughter of the second Khalifa. We have Abdul Shams and others, which the Holy Prophet of Islam, of course, changed. The idea is that the righteous name should be given. But not only, and I add this, not only does a righteous name be given, and ideally one that is that belong to the prophets and the awliya of Allah, the imma alayhum salam, and the righteous men and women, but at the same time, encouragement that the child begins to become proud of their name and mentions it with conviction. Why I say this? Because in America, where I was two, two weeks ago, I came across a number of people who said that it is now very much prevalent in different communities in America, whereby an individual who's named Ali is referred to as Alexander. Or Ja'far as Jeffrey. Or Muhammad as Mo. Yes? And the reason for that is that because people have become less associated with their Islamic identity, they are fearful to present themselves and have less pride in their background and their heritage and their Islamic faith. This needs to be rooted from the young age. Encouraged and explained what the name means. Number one. Number two, the Holy Prophet of Islam says you need to bring them up and raise them at tarbiyatul salihatul hasana. And number three, find a righteous spouse for them. Now, when it comes to the idea of child development and upbringing, most of us are aware, and this is a reminder, that despite our efforts that when the child is young and when we surround them in as many healthy situations as possible in terms of speech, as far as admonishing them, as far as presenting them with what should be said, the impact of it is indeed not great if the parents do not act as exemplary individuals and are not role models for the children. Because today, action speaks louder than words. Children learn more from the conduct of the parents than their speech. Imagine, if the father and the mother say, Perform salah in its correct time, and the father and the mother delay it. The child will never adopt this behavior. They will see this dichotomy, and indeed this will nurture hypocrisy in their hearts. They will develop this disliking because they see their parents telling them to do something, and then themselves not practicing it. If the, ch if the parent tells the child, why are you not reciting the Quran? Why are you not reading an Islamic book? And they themselves, the last time they read an Islamic book was five years ago. Can you imagine the impact that this will not have upon the children themselves? Likewise, when it comes to behavior, when it comes to akhlaq and morality, that the child is very observant from a young age. If the parents are telling the children, do not look at something haram, do not listen to something which is haram, do not utter that which is haram in terms of lying and backbiting and they see their parents practicing it, rest assured that the children will follow suit. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِيكُمْ نَارًا وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, in chapter 66, verse 6 of the Holy Quran, O oh you who believe, protect yourself and your families from Jahannam in which you may become the fuel for you yourself, that you turn into Jahannam on the Day of Judgment, God forbid, may Allah protect us all from the chastisement of hell. But the idea emerges and that the responsibility falls on the parents' shoulders in order to present their teachings and the teachings of the religion of Islam in the best possible way. If there is, for instance, a need for them to tell their children, if there is somebody who picks up the phone, a child picks up the phone, a classic example, and the parent does not wish to speak to that person, and says to him, says to the child, tell him I'm not here. Tell him I'm not here. And of course the child would then respond by saying that my father's not here. 
will become obedient to the father and the mother. But later on, if the father asks the child or the young man who returns home late, where were you? And he says, I was listening to a lecture. And he was, of course, hanging around in certain unsuitable places. We should not be surprised. We should not be surprised if this indeed happens. Therefore, today, those individuals who study child psychology have said that indeed the most effective method for getting the message across is by presenting the actions to the children by which they would learn before the words. Thirdly, awakening their conscience. This is important, brothers and sisters. What do we mean by awakening their conscience? Making them from a young age understand the philosophy, their background behind rulings, and being responsible for taking that important decision. In which case, in which way? Hijab, we have a problem. In Glasgow, about two months ago, I was approached by a young man who said, we have a problem. We have a nine-year-old sister of mine who is refusing to wear her hijab. And she says, I don't need to wear hijab. What is the point of hijab? I do not understand it. How do I make her understand the Islamic dress code of modesty and chastity? How do we go about this? Well, the idea, of course, is that we have to nurture an understanding from a young age by which they develop love of the Almighty and fear of their actions. Because there is a difference. A lot of us make them fear God. And sometimes this fear of God has severe repercussions. Has repercussions which result in disastrous consequences. I do not, I do not desire to give example of an individual like Irshad Manji. Most of you know her. A lady who herself has come out in the name of feminism and has become an enemy of the religion of Islam. However, of course we all know where she comes from. She comes from. And she herself states and claims that when she was young, her parents would say to her, if you lie, God will come. What would he do to you? He will cut your tongue. She said, when I would utter a lie, I would go into the bathroom and I'll check, is my tongue still there or not? And every time I look, the tongue is there. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm fine. So the problem is that they have not described the ill and the, the negative aspects and the connotations of lying. Likewise, what the philosophy and the beauty of hijab is to youngsters by continuous encouragement, by making them appreciate its beauty. Let me give you an example so that you have an understanding of what this awakening, the fitra, or enabling the dhamir, the conscience to be awakened for the child from a young age, like this alarm bell that sends these warning signals to us, it needs to be awakened from a young age. That we have a man by the name of Abu al-Aswad al-Du'ali, very famous companion of the commander of the faithful. And one day he came home, he noticed that his daughter was consuming honey, was having honey. Honey, of course, had not reached his house before. They were suffering with poverty, and they had not been able to purchase this. Immediately he became alarmed. He asks her, where did you get this honey from? She says that a man sent it. He says, who, who is this man? She said, I asked him and he replied back by saying, I am an envoy of Muawiyah. I am an envoy of Muawiyah. And Muawiyah sent you this honey. He looked at her. Now what did he do? Did he slap her? Take out the sandals? Or... Somehow banish her? No. He looked at her and said, you know this honey that you're consuming is poisoned. She said, how? How is it poisoned? In the lines of poetry which are beautiful, he describes to her that this honey is poisoned with the hatred of Amir al-Mu'mineen, placed by his arch enemy. Simple. She had deep love towards the Ahl al-Bayt from a young age. When she recognized this, the traditions tell us that she forcefully vomited the honey. The ones that she had eaten forcefully by herself, by her own desires. This is the extent that she had understood the severity of consuming that honey. He did not need to do anything else. He appealed to her conscience. He connected and tapped into her vamir. Now the idea of course is that we need to be able to inculcate love. Love of Allah and love of the Ahl al-Bayt brothers and sisters. We cannot overemphasize this. Today, and we saw unfortunately last week, what happened in the streets of London. The so-called groups of individuals who emerged on the streets and wanting to somehow attack or form a 
group against the mother of Ahl al-Bayt, the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, and uh, spread their falsehood and their very much uh, restricted opinions or viewpoints of the religion of Islam. We saw, indeed, the repercussions and the dangerous connotations that this society and this community, especially when it comes to Muslims living in the United Kingdom, have as far as future prospects between Sunni and Shia relationship is concerned. That is not my area. However, what I am concerned about is the different poles from within our generation, our youngsters, our youth. When I say the different poles, I mean those individuals who have indeed followed some extremist elements within the Shia, who have been indeed somewhat inspired by people who use the language of hatred and animosity and disunity. And that is because they were not nurtured and looked after specifically by their parents. The responsibility falls first and foremost onto the shoulders of the parents. They cannot blame anyone else. And we have people on their other extreme, in which sense, and this is a message that applies to us all, the people on the other extreme, the youth, who have slowly began disassociating, and their love and their affinity and their following of the path of Ahl al-Bayt is becoming less and less. We are not against questioning. Questioning is something that we pride ourselves in the school of Ahl al-Bayt, the institution of ijtihad, opening up the channel and the door for others to come forward and understand the faith and question with the spirit of understanding as opposed to other extremist elements. Today in the khutbah we spoke about how we face these extremist ideologies, we face these extremist ideologies who do not wish people to ask questions, who want you to stop and to follow whatever they give you. And an example that we gave today for the benefit of the believer brothers and sisters who are not there was an individual by the name of Professor Jeffrey Lang. Jeffrey Lang was where? He was an American professor from the University of Kansas City. He went and he embraced the religion of Islam in 1984. He went where? He went to Saudi Arabia. He went to teach at one of the universities and he had a number of questions about the religion of Islam. He was told, don't ask. You don't need to ask. These questions were pertinent. Today what we need to do is encourage our children to ask questions. Develop this ability to ask questions and indeed encourage them to be able to research their answers and present it to us. But importantly and pivotly, we have to ensure that the correct teachings are presented to them. And this man, when he came back, Professor Jeffrey Lang, what did he do? He authored a book. Do you know what the book's name is? I told people who were at khutbah today. The book's entitled, Even Angels Ask. Because angels of Allah ask the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, the idea is, of course, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, ask. We need to encourage our children to ask, but the love of Ahl al-Bayt is crucial. The Ahl al-Bayt have encouraged this. The Holy Prophet of Islam has encouraged this. Make sure we do not fall into the, the whole um, pits and the dangers of saying, you know what? These are cultural practices. Don't worry about Matam. Don't worry about the remembrance of Hussein. There is no need to recite Masaib or Maqtal. These are issues which are in the past. Let that's this for the past. Because these trends may develop in the future and we'll have only ourselves to blame. The love of Ahl al-Bayt should be adhered to. And we should nurture and indeed encourage our children to develop a strong affinity with the Ahl al-Bayt and understand Ahl al-Bayt the way sh they, they were understood in the correct manner. Of course, there are a number of important points. We are coming close to Salah time. I quickly mention one or two, and that is the encouragement around choosing the right friends, the right associates. Allah wa Taala says, every friend on the day of judgment shall become an enemy. Allah wa Taala says, make sure you choose your friends correctly in the right way. And we need to, when we're a young age, ask who the friends of our children are. Be able to choose the right friends for them, that they are in the right surroundings. Because today with the rise of social media, and that's another challenge that we have, we need to be able to not necessarily control them, but befriend them. In the idea that we need to be able to connect with them so that they open with us. That they do not think about us as, in, and as parents, who are far from reality. 
Connect with them in the real world. There is no problem for parents to have Facebook accounts or Twitter accounts or to be able to, have in, to engage with their children, with their daughters and their sons in the social networking phenomena. This will enable them for the people to recognize and for the children to see that their parents are not out of touch. And if they fall into sin and if they are in a danger, then they can come and they can indeed confide in their parents. Rather than what happens now with many people confiding in their friends, which, are, which is not always the best possible way. Because indeed friends are sometimes far away from the truth. And finally, one area that we have to encourage is external influences, the television, where we take them, make an effort for their parents to make an effort to save up to go for ziyara, to go for hajj, umrah. These spiritual injections, I call them, are so necessary and indeed very much required to ensure that our children are kept in touch with the Islamic culture, with the Islamic heritage, and with the Islamic teachings and the Islamic lands at the same time and are able to relate to Islamic history and of course seek lessons and apply it to their lives. There are a number of other considerations that we can keep in mind but of course in this particular day we extend our uh, congratulations and felicitations to Imam Sahib al-Asr wa zaman Ajrallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif to our eminent and respected maraja across the world and to all mu'mineen, brothers and sisters on the auspicious occasion of the wilada of the ninth imam. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all the tawfiq to be able to perform the ziyara of the imam alayhi salam in al kadimiya al muqaddasa in dunya and to attain his shafa'a in akhirah. And we pray to Allah wa ta'ala to enlighten our hearts and to give us tawfiq to rise to the challenge and to indeed honor the responsibility on our shoulders as far as nurturing a healthy community and children and our youngsters who will continue to live their lives in accordance with the teachings of the Quran and the Ahl al-Bayt. I say this and 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 I say this you mentioned like during during your talk about how parents should join Facebook in, in order to kind of communicate with their children. Uh, a recent study showed that um, young people have actually started leaving Facebook because um, the older generation of their families have started to join. <laughs> <laughs> and they're moving to more kind of like Instagram or wherever it is. Um, I don't want you to kind of comment on that and like more kind of say it's not kind of that simple. You've joined Facebook, that's it, you've understood what they are. Um, but. Well, that's the goal, isn't it? Uh, no, not really. Uh, the, the idea is, um, uh, of course, uh, if uh, the, the, the whole notion or the whole idea of the ch parents being connected with the, their offspring, with their children, is, is what we presented. If it is in the form of social networking, then so be it. But the reason why perhaps the children or those who have seen their parents join um, the social networking sites have decided to close it down or move on is because they have something to hide. And they don't want their parents to know uh, their, what they're up to. You know, on their, for instance, Facebook page, they might have on their likes, you know, singers and the Holy Quran and Nahjul Balagha. You know, so indeed this will show uh, an interesting image to their parent who will look at it or the posters, uh, the, uh, the pictures that they post, or the, uh, the pokes that they have, and so on. So the idea is that uh, perhaps th this is the reason. And perhaps another reason why they're leaving, and Allah knows best, is that the parents, instead of being advisory, becomes picking and becomes a source of discomfort for the child or for the youngster, let's say youngster for, um, for discussion purposes, and hence uh, it becomes an obstacle for them to communicate with others. So every time, why did you speak with that person? You shouldn't have done this, and so on. The, the, the whole idea is to befriend uh, our children in this day and age where they're asking so many questions and they wish to know more about the reasoning behind matters. If we become distant from them, and if we address them in a different way, then perhaps 
we will not uh, achieve the objectives and the goal. There is a, a tradition, a so-called tradition, a lot of believers think it's a tradition from Amir al-Mu'mineen. As far as my humble research and the research of some of the brothers uh, who have conducted this research, um, which essentially regarding the tradition that is attributed to Amir al-Mu'mineen, which says that speak to your uh, children with the language of their time, because they have created or they are present at the time which is different to your time, has no basis. There is no such tradition. And in fact, it's mentioned at the commentary of Nahjul Balagha by Ibn Abul Hadid al Mu'tazili, who says that it's a noteworthy thing to mention this. It's not found in Al Kafi of any of our books of tradition. It is narrated by a non Shia uh, scholar. In his interpretation of Nahj al Balagha, it's not even a hadith compilation. There is no um, chain, there is nothing there. So, our ulama have rejected this notion, this hadith, so called this hadith. So, this idea of um, speaking to them in their language perhaps doesn't require us to take a hadith, or it, it is common sense, it's rational. Um, but it doesn't necessarily, because this notion has been adopted to say, well, allow them, because this is the modern times. Because Amir al muminin is saying, allow them to practice the way they would here. So, for instance, when it comes to hijab, let them wear the tight clothing and the colorful ones and the attractive ones and let them put on makeup because this is the common, this is what's acceptable here. I had a sister ask me in a, in a program, that she said, you know, you said that hijab moves on with the times. So surely at this moment, the hijab should be something which is resembling what the fashion is um, outside, you know. Uh, but the problem of that is, of course, that's not how we are presenting the uh, whole idea. What we're saying is that in terms of being approachable and in terms of connecting and being down to earth and realizing the problems and the challenges that they face, reading about what's going on. A lot of our parents haven't got an idea really about um, the challenges sometimes that the certain youth face. Um, perhaps they don't share certain activities. There is no problem with the parent, for instance, the father going to a football match with their son, you know, from a young age. That's fine. There is no problem with that. Um, you know, even accompanying them to certain activities and so on. It's nurturing and fostering that very close relationship that we wish to develop, especially in this day and age. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. I thoroughly enjoyed your lecture. Just want to ask, uh, how do we set example during Ramadan? Some of us we don't fast together. We don't celebrate Eid together. Like children would celebrate different Eid, and I would celebrate different Eid. So yeah. how would my children? How do I set example then? You see, we are a number of times facing challenges. I have my two young, uh, two young uh, boys with me on the way here. They asked me, the, the older one said, uh, Daddy, can I be, when I grow up, a sheikh and a footballer at the same time? And of course, there are difficult questions. You know, sometimes, you know, you, you, you are, how can you explain that this is not possible? But you have to deal with them in their own mentality, in their own mindset. And of course, diversity of opinions as far as our ulama and the different rulings that we have when it comes to Eid and the sighting of the moon perhaps is blown out of proportion and too often considered a point of contention and a negative trend that we have within Shia madhab. However, if we step back for a, a few steps and look at it uh, you know, wholeheartedly and completely in a completely pic complete picture, we recognize that as human beings, we're all different, and we come out with different ideas and beliefs and sometimes ways in which we can achieve what we want. And diversity is a healthy trend, you know, to have different opinions. When it comes to our ulama having different um, interpretations of the texts and the hadith literature, this doesn't or should not be presented in a negative way. One way we can, under we can present it to our children, perhaps, is to highlight or to very briefly try and discuss this whole notion that um, the moon is sighted in certain places and not sighted in others and present it in a way that they can understand. If this is a difficulty to understand the whole aspect of sighting and why is the parent, father uh, having um, uh, iftar on one day and the mother is not, and if you find that the child is finding it difficult and it's affecting them adversely, there are solutions. And the solution is travel. 
Sharia law has permitted you to travel. If you find, and this is certainly permissible, no one's going to tell you why you're traveling. If you find that that is causing adverse uh, impact on your children when it comes to understanding of faith, I haven't come across many children or few children, in fact, who have been somehow um, affected negatively in this regard. Um, it's mostly affecting the parents themselves, the father and the mother being uncomfortable and a state of discomfort when it comes to different dates of Eid and so on. Um, it, there are some people blocking cars. If you if you are blocking someone, please can you move the car? Mazurko. Um, uh, you know, you mentioned about uh, the parents joining the Facebook and uh, this social media. Yes. This is something which is uh, in a way difficult, especially once you get to after a certain age and uh, the social media being a new phenomena and uh, there are problems with social media even for the society the contemporary society itself how to tackle the social media and then you add to it the point of view of the Muslims and their uh, take on the social media and how it is conducted are you aware of any study made by the Muslims themselves as to how the social media is developing and how the Muslims should react and how the guidance to, can be given. Is there any, any study done in that aspect by any Muslims, if you are aware of? At the moment, there are studies at the seminaries in Hausa, in Qom, and Najaf that I've come across when it comes to the impact and the jurisprudence of the internet, so to speak. And there are, of course, discussions taking place about the subject of e akhlaq we call it. e akhlaq mannerism and conduct over the internet, how we present ourselves, and so on. I haven't come across studies as we see in the West, so to speak, because uh, as we uh, unfortunately uh, admit, we are sometimes lagging behind in terms of scientific um, analysis of trends and developments in terms of certain ways in which people conduct themselves. However, one thing that we can be certainly um, sure of is that even despite the difficulty of parents joining the social media and perhaps taking part and being somewhat active, the benefit of trying to understand the method and the way in which a child is thinking, in which line are they developing themselves, in which area do they seem interested in, and that will help also immensely in this regard. If a parent is unable to join these sites, and notice how, of course, as you mentioned correctly, then there are negative aspects. I mean, we have given lectures about Facebook and where we've said certain times certainly turns into a facade book, no doubt about that, um, in terms of the mingling that takes place, the pictures that are posted, uh, which lacks hijab, the um, accusations that are spread on, on social media the lack of mannerism and etiquettes that we see in certain practices by certain people. So there are dangers to social media, but it's a reality that the youth are facing and are utilizing, so we can't run away from it. I respectfully disagree with those who have come forward and said, forget Facebook, ban it, don't allow our children to go on it, because this is certainly not how we see the trend emerging at the moment. And uh, social media is taking over the lives of many people in terms of communication and how they're getting their message across. If it is difficult for the parent to get into these avenues, it is always a good idea to facilitate or to ask someone either to help them or if they do not wish to take part, for that person to somewhat, for them to introduce that person or to befriend an individual that they trust that will be able to give them an insight, an overall picture of how their child is thinking and what kind of activities they're taking place. This is not spying. If people say this is spying, it's not spying. It is a responsibility on the shoulders of the parents to be able to not leave their children because today at the age of 16, in the Western world, we find the children running away or the parents wanting the child to go out of the house. And that's it. The connection and the, any link is severed except that they remain a father and a mother. Of course, the religion of Islam looks at it much more holistically and is a much bigger responsibility in, in that regard for a healthy society and a strong community. Any questions from sisters? Otherwise? 
by this final question from the other side. Thank you for a wonderful talk and, and coming to us today. Um, I think, Marshall, you, you are knowing you for, for so long, you're Marshall, very accessible, available on most social media, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and very easy to communicate with, even if someone did not know you. When can I ask, is any one of our merchants going to be as accessible as you on Twitter and social media to our... I mean, you see these Saudi scholars, not as a joke, and they have hundreds of thousands of followers on Twitter, yeah. especially in Malaysia, Philippines, and it's just astonishing the amount of people. I mean, they are more popular than most celebrities. Yeah. And yet, we cannot connect, and for this has been a discussion for years, we cannot connect, and, and the, the, the phrase you use is so pertinent, connecting. We cannot connect with any of our senior scholars as much as we love them, and we talk about them all the time, and they're the center of our philosophical and theological thought. We cannot connect with them. Yeah. That's a difficult question. Yeah, no, certainly you have more, a... More of your thoughts yes, on Yes, yes, uh, certainly it's a concern for our youth that they've grown up in a culture and a civilization or so to speak in an environment where you're able to uh, have a, a conversation or even to send a question to the prime minister or to people in government or MPs and expect a reply and so on. There shouldn't be anyone who is not accessible um, in, in our minds and in our thoughts. And in a way that's true. But let's not forget that of course the Maraja are not accustomed to the latest technology and they've reached an age Certainly where, as was mentioned, it's very difficult to get into that. Many of our Maraja's offices are on social media. Um, they're present there. Some Mujtahids, perhaps, or those who are um, students of Mujtahids are there in, in, in social media and are contactable. Um, the challenge, of course, is for the future, I think, more than what it is at the present in terms of developing ulama who understand the needs of people not only in the West, but all around the world, are able to uh, connect to them and are accessible. I think that that is the challenge now that is being pushed in seminaries in many different parts of the world, and they're recognizing the impact that the internet is having. You know, um, certainly our Maraja now quite a few have uh, YouTube clips and um, YouTube um, channels where people can watch some of the lectures of certain ulama, certain esteemed scholars as well, um, satellite channels and so on. So in that regard, they are there. And perhaps one way to bridge the gap is to connect with those who are close to them and, and are you know able to have a um, you know relationship or do have do have a relationship with these maraja and present our opinions and thoughts to those individuals who will, in part will do the same but i will encourage you know i always encourage about maybe 2 3 years ago many of our maraja offices were not into facebook or twitter and so on and because people started speaking up and saying let's have you participating, let's, let's have some kind of involvement, they started thinking about it. Because let's remember, and this is quite um, evident, even our Maraja offices, they're not run by youth anyway, um, in that sense. So even some of them struggle to you know, adopt to social networking in, in that sense. So, and there is taboo as well on social networking. Some people view it as something which is um, problematic in nature because all they've heard about it is negativity. Um, so those are all aspects that have contributed to the slow, gradual uh, involvement and participation of our ulama and our scholars. But you mentioned the Saudis. It's interesting, because a few days ago, the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Abdul Aziz al-Sheikh, very famously said, everybody who uses Twitter are fools. It's there. And he clearly says it, and he says this is not in line with Islamic teachings and so on and so forth. And many of these so-called sheikhs are actually exposing themselves um, in, 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 in Twitter and in social media, uh, exposing, exposing their lack of knowledge, their very extremist views, and so on, you know, in, in that regard. They come out in their attacks against the Shia by saying you can't watch Shia 
children's channel because they send messages which are subtle in terms of believing in Shia. Very famously, a, a scholar from that particular ideology said that a um, male cannot go and swim in the sea because the sea is considered feminine and therefore entering into a sea is considered something haram. It's there on Twitter, many of their scholars. They, because they are under pressure to tweet something and the lack of knowledge shows. We'll end there. Salawat. Allahumma salli ala.